but let's talk about the future right now. Joining us on the line is Dr. Parag Khanna, author of Move, How Mass Migration Will Reshape the World and What It Means for You. If that is not a title of a book, Parag, I don't know what is. Great to have you with us this morning on Money FM. <laughs> It's certainly a long enough title. Uh, great to see you again, Ben. How's it going? <laughs> Very good. Uh, now, I've had the good fortune to uh, to hear you talk about your book uh, just this week at the 1880 Club. And it is, uh, it is a very, uh, I think, thought-provoking, provocative book. It comes uh, following two other books that you've done, one in 2016, Connectivity, Mapping the Future of Global Civilizations, and 2019, The Future is Asian, which we had you on the show for, uh, The Global Order in the 21st Century. So as we look at this latest book, how does this flow from your previous two? And then we'll talk more specifically about what's in the book. Yeah, I mean, in terms of the stream of consciousness or the arc of the narrative, this is definitely, um, in a way, a logical continuation of Connectography, which is about global infrastructure and connectivity. And the Asia book, which, among other things, was about demographics and Asia being representing the majority of the human population. So let's put those two together. You have a world of ever-expanding connectivity networks, physical and digital, and you have a world population that's prim primarily Asian. And therefore, I'm answering the question, what is the human species going to do with all of this connectivity in the decades ahead? And primarily, it's going to be Asians, because the further in the future you look, the more the world is Asian demographically. So, I mean, let me just stop right there. But, but uh, one last point is that basically... I'm, it's a book about geography, but not just rocks and geology and oceans, but rather human geography, which is mm -hmm. us. There are 8 billion people in the world. There will probably never be more than 9 billion people in the world, which is a significantly lower estimate than what we've had over the last 10 or 15 years. But because of the baby busts that the world has been experiencing – from the global financial crisis through COVID, of course, and in any case, rich countries, whether it's Singapore or Canada or America, have very low fertility. We live in a world in which actually we're going to start to view this finite stock of human beings as a talent pool, and there will be a global war for talent to recruit young people into countries, and Singapore is going to be obviously a front, and, you know, front and center in that in that talent war. I find this subject absolutely fascinating, Parag. I really do. And now, look, you're talking more about an economic perspective there. But the conventional wisdom says that as climate change becomes a more pressing concern with the younger generations, the rich will flock to certain safer countries and the low-lying countries will pay as a consequence. So, you know, Singapore is relatively safe, so the rich will fl flood here and people will leave Australia and other countries. I mean, how do you see that playing out? Do you see it in such pessimistic terms? Well, so I have four scenarios in the book, and three of them are rather pessimistic indeed, dire, you might even say, in terms of the reorganization of our human geography and whether it proceeds in a sustainable and in a utilitarian way, one that benefits the majority of the, of the world's population. And again, three of the scenarios don't look so good. One of them does. I call it northern lights. It doesn't really mean that everyone needs to migrate to, to Canada and Russia and the rest of us will perish. It's really about whether or not, if you take all of the climate forecasts that show us what geographies will be livable, um, can we move enough people there so that the maximum number of human beings survive the constant climate or cascading climate disruptions that we're facing? And the answer is we can do it. You know, we can do it logistically very easily. Again, going back to connectivity, right, and infrastructure. You can put people mm -hmm. on planes. You can put them on trains. You can put them on ferry boats. You can move them to air-conditioned cities. You can build nomadic enclaves and centers in uh, across Siberia. We have the technology not only today but yesterday to save the human species. But, of course, there's a lot of intervening political variables to get that right, which is why I'm overall relatively pessimistic unless we actually have this collective psychological realization that there really aren't that many human beings in the world. And I, this is the part that's the real punch in the face. We have actually all, anyone of a certain age, above the age of 40, let's say, has grown up thinking that the world population is this runaway train that's going to be 15 billion people and we're actually heading towards a Malthusian crisis of overpopulation. No such thing is true. 
literally 9 billion human beings is a very small number of human beings, right? There are far less human beings than there are of most other species on the planet Earth, other than the ones that we have killed off, right? Mm -hmm. You know, so there's not as many pandas, right, as there are humans, right? Because but, right, just jump in there, sorry, just jump in there. But those other species are not doing the harm to the planet that humans are, are they? They're exactly, not devouring you know, the natural resources like humans are. Right. And it's a good thing that our population numbers are stabilizing and are actually going to decline by organic means because you're going to have the, the sort of mortality gradually of the baby boomers and you have children having very few children. So the world population will stabilize and it will even decline. The question is, does it drop back down to 7 or 8 billion, or does it collapse due to, again, spiraling out of control climate change yep. or further pandemics to 3 or 4 billion people, which would not be a pretty picture? Parag, let's, let's, talk, let's unpack that just a little bit, because that might be a surprising concept to mm -hmm. our listeners, our Facebook Live uh, friends. Um, and we're talking with Dr. Parag Khanna, author of Move, How Mass Migration Will Reshape the World and What It Means for You. Uh, let's Let's discuss Gen Alpha, uh, the next right. generation coming up, and their and their uh, reproductive habits, or what they might right. be, uh, <laughs> according to some demographers, including yourself. But let's unpack that a little bit, and why you say the peak population of the planet may only be nine billion versus fifteen or sixteen. Sure. And apologies to those on uh, Facebook Live. I will wake up for Glenn, but I will not comb my hair for Glenn. So, <laughs> uh, you look great, so, Mike. Uh, you look great. So let's, yeah, no worries. <laughs> so Gen Gen Z, which is today's you know uh, pre tweens, tweens, teenagers, is the largest single generation of human beings that our species has ever produced. There's about 1.9 billion members of Gen Z. So if you have a Gen Z kid, they're really special, right? But guess what? Gen Alpha, if you have a little baby, a toddler, Gen Alpha will be smaller. Gen Alpha isn't yet complete. Gen Alpha will complete in the year 2025. But when we reconvene, Glenn, in January 2026, we will know matter-of-factly that the number of Gen Alpha kids on Earth is smaller than Gen Z. And that is the seminal kind of moment in a way. But it's already happening. We already know that that's what's going to happen. And so the fact of the matter is that it's the result of the fact that both millennials and Gen Z have a have a reduced proclivity for having children, and that's a result. Why is, of why is that wrong? Right. So it's economic stress. So the financial crisis hit in the 20, 2007, 2000, uh, 20, 27, sorry, 2007, 2008, just as many millennials were considering having children or maybe having another another child. But the economic stress was very severe at the time, and so people pushed off. Uh, having children. Then within a decade, boom, you have COVID, which is a baby bust that is significantly more severe than even the financial crisis was. And on top of all of this, at the same time, you have climate change. And when you ask in surveys all over the world of young people uh, of childbearing age and young families, they're asked, why don't you want to have children? And the answer is either economics, just too expensive, or it's climate. And increasingly, climate is the dominant reason, but it's both at the same time. So literally, young, the young generation around the world carries this climate guilt that having a child equates mm. to additional damage to the planet. That is a fascinating scenario, yeah. Parag. And let's use, because I think this is so interesting to me, let's use Singapore as a microcosm for the world after you've answered your phone. Hello. Uh, I will not be answering the that's phone. That's Dan, sorry. the producer, calling you. Um, let's, let's, let's use Did I say Sing something offensive? I don't I don't work for yeah. Samsung. No, it's don't, the don't call me. It's the Singapore government. No, let's, let's, talk, let's use Singapore as a microcosm because I think it encapsulates everything you're talking about. Low fertility. Younger generation having fewer babies. So what happens? Singapore has no choice but to import. So it imports larger numbers of foreigners. Now, there are projections of six, seven, even 10 million has been mooted as a possibility for Singapore because it's relatively climate stable with lots of climate measures in place, lots of switches towards, you know, green energies and so on and so on. However, I'm thinking about it from a political standpoint and how this could be replicated around the world. You could have massive uncertainty, massive polit uh, political tensions if your population, if your native population is outnumbered by foreigners. Imagine if you have a scenario where 8 million people live in Singapore and 5 million of them are foreigners. I, I'm, I'm projecting as an example right. to follow your theory. What could that do 
or what could potentially happen for Singapore and therefore the rest of the right. world? Well, there's only one country in the world with such a ludicrously lopsided demographic Qatar? ratio. Um, well, so Qatar is very small, but equivalent to mm. Singapore would be the United Arab Emirates. So right, right, right next door, where the indigenous population is only one tenth of the of the total, you know, sort of sort of uh, population of the country. Mm. However, what they've started to do is to give ever more citizenship to Arab peoples of different nationalities because the UAE is a fairly powerful passport, and they're doing that, by the way. And no accident to copy Singapore, because, of course, Singapore gives citizenship to many foreigners uh, from across the world. And so when you say the, the pu future potential ratio of Singaporeans, of you know, natives, locals, to foreigners, how do you define that? Because, again, mm -hmm. a lot of people who are Singaporean are not were not born here. So it's actually far more subtle and complicated um, than, than what you're describing. And in terms of, you know, again, there's nothing that. The Singapore government is not unique in that it, alongside uh, the French government and the Russian government and many governments have tried to promote fertility, you know, sort of, you know, a voucher for a date night, you know, really a day off for Valentine's Day. You get the drift. A baby bonus. Um, yeah. Et yeah. A baby yeah. bonus. This, it does not work. I've looked at every possible scheme in the world. It doesn't work, right? And, you know, China has gone from the one-child policy to the two-child policy to the three-child policy, but no one took them up on the two-child policy, let alone the three-child policy. So let's face it. This is reality as it is. Let's accept it, and let's actually embrace the idea that we need to do a better job with promoting well-being for those human beings that exist in the world and make them us, you know, make them part of our societies for the betterment of the human condition rather than saying, hmm, let's cripple our own economy and have really low immigration and in the hopes that our own quote-unquote native people will have more children that they're never going to have. That's not what I call pragmatism. You know, it's my job mm. to work with governments all over the world to get them to, to, to attain the possible, not to cling to utopian and naive dreams. Mm, fascinating. Yeah, we're talking with Parag Khanna, author of Move, How Mass Migration Will Reshape the World and What It Means for You. Uh, he is also the founder and managing partner of Future Map. Parag, you have talked about uh, the future of the uh, the future of the world is going to be Asian youth, and also the future of successful countries will be those who um, accept high-skilled foreign talent, and the downfall for some countries will be the ones that don't accept that talent. That's a lot to unpack, but tell us your thoughts on, on those two issues. And the losers are also those who are literally losing their own talent, uh, not only right. not attracting you know, from the global pool, but where you see young people leaving a country, it means that they are the best signal. You don't need a political risk analyst from New York to tell you that Bulgaria is in trouble because the fact is all you have to do is look at the outflow of young Bulgarians. And what I did was I looked at conscription policies, among other uh, measures around the world, every country that has military conscription, including Singapore. And I said, what do young people do when they reach conscription age? And what I found is that from Korea to Turkey to Russia, everywhere, the, the rite of passage for any young male is to get out. Like, pay whatever bribe you can. And, of course, it's one of the great virtues of Singapore, not only that NS is um, mandatory and, and, and instituted as such, but that it's also desired. People feel that they come out a better person, you know, as a result. And it strengthens social solidarity, which is incredibly important compared to those countries that lack that common, uh, that social cohesion. So anyway, bottom line, though, though, you know, if I could if I could put, uh, you know, just um, a hammer on this one point, the fact is that if a country is gaining young people, it's going to thrive in the future, barring mm -hmm. climate change or other unforeseen you know, volatility. If a country is losing its young people, it's absolutely finished. Don't invest there. And that's it. That's your layman's guide to, <laughs> you know, investing in the 21st century and determining the success or failure of societies in the 21st century. But I'm pleased to report that if you look at the last two years during COVID, when allegedly we were all locked down, a lot of young people did a lot of moving. Because instead of one country having a nomad visa program, for which Estonia was only famous in sort of cult circles, today 75 countries have nomad visa programs. 75 countries woke up during COVID and said, oh my God, we, are lo we don't have business travelers, tourists, students, um, you know, so what does that visa people, mean exactly? What is a nomad visa? 
for those. Well, who don't so it, it isn't always the same, but roughly speaking, it's just come and show up. You'll get a visa on arrival. Stay as long as you like. Please don't commit a crime. Use our Wi-Fi. You know, rent our Airbnbs. <laughs> stay in our cafes. Just be in our country and spend money because otherwise we'll go bankrupt. And there's many, there's a wide spectrum of offerings within such programs. And again, 75, 80, soon 100, probably soon the whole world will wake up and realize it's better to have people than not to have people. Collecting people is collecting power. And it's actually one of the oldest principles of geopolitics going back to the 19th century. But it's something that we forgot in an, in an era of demographic abundance, which is what the 20th century was. But the 21st century is going to be an era of demographic scarcity where we're actually fighting over people. So the fact that Singapore happens to be an incredibly attractive place is something to play on and not an opportunity to let slip by. That's the part I'm fascinated by, this uh, dem uh, democra uh, demographic scarcity, as you mentioned. So in theory, you know, I, I lived in Australia for a while and there were Rust Belt towns, you know, post-industrial decay, former gold mining towns that had been completely abandoned. America the same, post-industrial decay. Sure. You see it across parts of Northern Europe, the UK, the north of England, mass exodus there. Do you foresee long term, I'm just curious, where you could almost have rust belt countries entire regions that are almost empty of people is that a possibility yeah. in the long term absolutely and you know i searched scoured far and wide in the kind of literature whether it's even climate change literature or even the uh, literature around kind of the economic evolution of countries and no one was willing to say or to call these places you really really put your finger on something so important truly i call them vacant states Yep. And I actually foresee that entire swaths of the planet will be physically vacated because they're yep. no longer habitable. The country of Yemen will have no water, and that's 25 or 30 million people who will literally either die or leave. Yemen, that's it. You have two choices. You can't live without water, as we know. Um, you know, Turkmenistan, you know, other parts of parts of Africa. So I call these places vacant states and they'll no longer meet the legal definition of a state. So I have to actually call them something else because the definition of state in international law is that you have a permanent resident population and your borders are recognized by your neighbors in the international community. So the places still have a role. We might actually dump nuclear waste in those places. We may just go and send in tractors and mine their soil mm. and sediment for minerals. Mm. The, the geography will be useful, but they will not be livable or habitable for human beings. And that's actually happening today. And I yeah. was kind of shocked in my research that not enough people are just calling it what it is. But this is where, you know, kind of my work is in geography, and this is fundamentally a geographical question, not one of whether or not it's politically palatable to say this or not to say this. I've seen it in towns across Australia. It's amazing. And they Absolutely. say they'll, they'll, they'll come back, they'll come back. And you, how? how no, they they, they will come never back. come back. There are places, yeah. though, by the way, I mean, you know, there's, there's, there's happy stories out there. If you look at Detroit, Michigan, now it was deindustrialized mm, sure. you know, yep. through the 2000s because of economic outsourcing and globalization and, you know, uh, wages not keeping pace and so forth. But because Michigan is a climate oasis, whereas the parts of Australia that are desertifying are not, you can imagine Michigan in particular, you know, having a thriving population 10, yeah. 15, 20 years from now and having a, being home to a whole host of new industries. And you can already see the signals of that today. So there's actually these yo-yo effects. People leave a place when it collapses economically, but return to a place because it happens to have a thriving climate. And that's the kind of chaos, if you will, that I'm foreseeing in terms of our demographic movement. So it's very nice if you mm. live in an island of stability and, and one of the things that we noticed during COVID is, hmm, what were the best places to be during COVID around the world? You know, uh, Taiwan, New Zealand, Singapore, Iceland, Malta. What do we have in, all in common? Well, we are islands who can close mm -hmm. ourselves off and, and we're, we're wealthy and we're well governed. So the best place to be in times of stress is uh, island nations that are well governed and wealthy. So there you go. yourselves lucky. Brilliant. Parag, this is a great conversation. Yeah. Uh, we do have to leave it there. Dr. Parag Khanna, who is uh, the managing partner and founder of Future Map, also the author of Move, How Mass Migration Will Reshape the World and What It Means to You. Parag, if you want to put any links uh, in the Facebook live chat to, for your book and, and your websites and things, please do that. I'm sure our, our, our listeners would love to see that. Uh, in the meantime, thanks for being with us. Hope to have you on again. A pleasure. Anytime. Take care, guys. Thanks, man. Awesome. That's absolutely fascinating. <laughs> I, I, 
listen to him all day. It's just the topic is amazing. That, but do, this this idea of geography and really thinking about locations and what that means is uh, is is part of a conversation that's not really being had it at a big level i have it with my daughter now something that would have been unthinkable when i was a child you can't just think about where you're going to live for work you have to think about where you're going to live for for political security for climate security it's happening now in real time what i said about australia is true there are parts of australia never coming back wow we'll be right back with traffic uh, uh a little bit of music and then we're going to go to the national library board to talk about curiosity stay with us right here on money fm saturday mornings saturday morning on money fm 89.3 